um, as we uh, uh, as is customary, we're going to post this uh, uh, to the Cantera Initiative website afterwards, and we'll make the uh, recording and the slides available to uh, uh, to our members. Um, but I wanted to uh, to start by uh, welcoming everyone. This is an exciting um, uh, member meeting because there's a lot of things to uh, uh, to celebrate. Uh, 22 saw a year of togetherness, as, as you're seeing uh, Kay and myself here together. Cantera uh, was out uh, in the market at events uh, around the globe, uh, had a very um, strong presence um, here in the US, uh, in Europe, uh, in Asia, and um, uh, really continuing to promote the international aspect of, of what we do as an organization. But um, you know, identity and personal data took uh, center stage uh, during the pandemic. And I think uh, coming through that and out of that now, um, a lot of uh, organizations are understanding the importance of what this organization does. So uh, the growth of the market uh, naturally helped uh, drive the growth in our uh, membership um, in the importance of our assurance program, uh, as well as our involvement in more international mm -hmm. efforts. Uh, we're going to talk all about um, those things throughout the course of the next hour, hour and a half, um, as well as really get into um, the uh, the candidates for uh, the board of directors for next year as well. Um, but I wanted to start by you know thanking uh, obviously the prior leadership who uh, built a great foundation for us to grow on top of and really scale out this organization. Many of the people. Um, who I see on our member meeting today have been involved in this organization for many, many years. Um, and, you know, the, the organization, um, you know, has has grown pretty steadily throughout its history. But this this year, as you'll see, has been really exponential growth in terms of uh, membership and in terms of the assurance program. So I want to thank the prior leadership. I want to thank um, Kay, who I've been able to work closely with as the executive director. Her leadership has been absolutely exceptional. I think um, her style and approach has really um, changed the perception for many around uh, the globe in terms of um, the way that Cantera engages, the value that we can uh, provide to um, our members and, and to uh, the broader ecosystem. Um, and her leadership within uh, the organization itself has really brought uh, great players to the table. Um, and I, you know, I credit you with a lot of uh, the success that we're going to discuss here today. So thank you for your leadership, Kay, as the executive director. Um, I want to highlight Lindsay, who's been a great partner to Leif, um, you know, in in terms of uh, helping um, advance the assurance program and and uh, you know transition that from Ruth, who uh, put in many years of great service to us and has remained a strong partner to Cantera since she's left. Um, but but Lindsay has has really um, uh, stepped up and helped support. Uh, the Assurance Review Board through a, a year of, of a lot of activity, uh, which we're excited to get to. And then Karen, who has helped amplify um, Cantera around the globe with a lot of uh, innovative marketing initiatives, uh, which we're excited to share with this organization. Um, and, and I'll speak for Karen. We appreciate all the members who get engaged with our events, help uh, further promote uh, the different uh, social posts or share uh, activity that we're promoting at Cantera uh, to, to help uh, raise the awareness of the good work that everyone in this organization is doing. Uh, Armin for uh, really all the IT support. I, you know, it's a lot broader than just uh, managing uh, the website, which takes a lot of work in and of itself because of all the collaboration tools uh, and keeping us connected. Armin, appreciate uh, all the work you do. And then Shay, who's the newest member of the staff uh, who just came on to help, um, you know, organize and, and support board efforts, uh, administrative efforts, and, and um, uh, recently uh, the work that we're doing in the UK, uh, which we'll speak to um, uh, as we go through the presentation. Uh, a huge shout out for everyone involved with the assurance program. The assurance program is, is really uh, the crown jewel of the organization here and uh, you know, something that um, you know, takes a lot of work from a lot of people <clears throat> and uh, recognize that 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 is uh, mostly volunteer work uh, that people do because they believe in the importance of the work the organization does um, and and want to protect that. So appreciate the work uh, that's being done there, and certainly appreciate uh, Maria Vicino's work um, from a board perspective to 
you know, help with operational um, effectiveness within the assurance program as well and maturing the way that we do business. Um, a, a shout out to uh, all of our members and, and work group leaders, which is where a lot of the work of the organization happens. Uh, and then last but certainly not least, I want to um, thank uh, all of the board members who um, have put in a lot of effort uh, behind the scenes. And, um, you know, Colin and I had made a conscious decision um, a few years ago when I took on the board president role uh, to eliminate the kind of pay for play aspects um, and having board seats be more figurehead-ish in nature, uh, but to get really into a working board model. And that required people that were, uh, you know, super committed to rolling up their sleeves uh, and, and helping guide with strategic priorities that we set um, uh, two years ago. And, um, and we've continued to work and advance those. We're going to talk about some of those board priorities uh, as we go through and the work that um, the organization has done to deliver on those. But um, I'm, I'm really uh, excited about where the organization is today. We've never been more financially strong. Um, and resilient. Um, we've never had, I think, better prospects uh, to have a true international impact um, in terms of what we do from a, a vision and mission uh, perspective. And um, I think we've got a lot of momentum going into uh, 2020. So, uh, Kay, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Matt. And thanks for acknowledging all the various folks. It takes all of us to really make Kintar work and be successful. And it's really been a great team effort. Um, so I just want to take everyone just briefly, you can see our agenda, um, a couple of administrative things we are recording so if you came on after the recording started just know that this is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Qatar website. Also, for those of you who do not have a speaking role if you would turn your microphones on mute, that would just be helpful so that we don't get background noise by accident. Mm -hmm. Um, so we are, we have a lot of things to cover in an hour and a half. And so I've asked everyone who's talking to please try to keep their remarks brief, but that means that you may have questions and we'd be happy to follow up with you at another time, even if it's not in today's call. We will be starting with the organizational updates. Um, uh oh, did we lose? Um, and from that, we will take a look at one of the board's strategic priorities, which was the DEI initiative. Um, we'll be getting reports about membership, about our communications, about the insurance program in the US, as well as in the UK. As Matt also mentioned, we'll hear from the Leadership Council and the, and the various work groups who've been very active this year. I'll just briefly talk about some of our liaisons and our association engagements with others. And if a few of our liaison folks are, are on the call at that point, I may introduce you and give you a shout out. Um, we'll also be introducing before we close the candidates for the election for the at-large directors. And as Matt mentioned, there are no longer any uh, paid for seats. So everyone on the board, with the exception of the Leadership Council representatives, are elected from the full membership. Um, and that will open after uh, our meeting. It will open tomorrow. So that is the agenda in, in the short amount of time. There is our antitrust statement, just as a reminder to everyone. Uh, we basically start every meeting, including the work groups, with this statement. Um, so I'd like to then turn it over for organizational updates. Our first speaker on this will be Patrick Clancy, who is on the board and served this year as vice president for member engagement. Patrick. Hey, Kay. Thanks very much. And thanks, Matt. Um, so guys, uh, as, as Matt mentioned, you know, there, there's been a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of process improvement, a lot of you know, kind of governance improvement or revisions uh, over the last year, um, and we'll go through a lot of them throughout this brief. But one in particular that we'll start off with is the revision to the Cantera bylaws. Um, so any you know any organization, any board of directors is only as strong as its governance, um, and this seminal document, the Cantera bylaws, and all of the policies um, that flow from it, whether it's a financial policy or something else, um, they have to be occasionally refreshed. They need to be reviewed um, and they should be kept up to date uh, with the, the best practices, not only of 
uh, of organizations such as Cantara, uh, but also so that they're representative of our membership and where we're trying to go. Um, also that they reflect, you know, kind of the mission and the vision uh, of the organization and, and our members. So you see here on the slide, and I've, I've, I've pulled out three of the, uh, the large, you know, kind of changes there, but our last update was in February, 2021. So it's been, um, you know, almost two years uh, since, since there's been a, a revision. Um, we've had some, a number of, you know, kind of uh, uh, important changes. Uh, the first, you know, Kay already mentioned, um, revising, um, you know, the, the kind of pay to play uh, board seats. Um, but I'll, I'll start at the top there with revising just kind of our organizational purpose and that alignment with the Cantara initiative mission and vision. You know, the, the benefits around this, uh, the board felt, you know, it's going to promote greater consistency because again, um, we are stating very clearly in our bylaws what, what that purpose of the organization is. Um, and ensuring that that's represented in our operating documents. The second there, uh, with those paid board positions, uh, we also updated the member categories. Uh, this was to ensure, again, consistency uh, in, in our operations, whether it's in the working groups, the leadership council, or the board of directors. So it helps and it benefits by clarifying our org structure. Um, everyone is, again, standing for election uh, on the board, except for those leadership council representatives. Um, and we we hope and we think we believe from uh, the engagement this year that it's going to increase overall engagement. Um, certainly the board was more engaged uh, this year because everyone stands for election. Um, and if we don't contribute, if we don't produce, um, every board member knows that they may not be reelected. So there's a, there's an incentive there. And then finally, um, you know, we added guidance uh, and very specific guidance around nominations, our election process, the voting rules and who were eligible voters. A lot of this information existed, but it existed in a lot of different places. Um, you could find it, you know, on the website, or you could find it in, you know, kind of past, um, you know, message board type documents. Uh, but nothing was consolidated into the bylaws. So, for organizational transparency, uh, you know, we memorialized uh, this governance process in the bylaws. Uh, so again. Uh, we can continue to operate as a, as a transparent organization uh, and one that is uh, representative of our members and is a good rep representative and steward uh, in the, uh, the broader identity community. So with that, uh, Kay, I'll, uh, I'll stop and I'll, I'll pass it back over to you. Terrific. Thank you for that, uh, Patrick. And again, um, I'm happy to you know, have people send me questions. We will be posting that revised version on the website. So you'll be able to see all of the changes that Patrick <clears throat> summarized so well. Now I'd like to turn as part of that organizational update to Jordan Burris. Jordan is uh, the new chair of our diversity, equity and inclusion initiative. And uh, I'll let him talk a little bit about where that stands. It's, it's still a work in progress, but um, Jordan, I has a lot of things to share. So, you see thanks, Kay. Uh, and I promised Kay I'd be uh, brief so that we should have to play the Oscar theme music and uh, uh, <laughs> kick me off of the mic. Uh, so, uh, first and foremost, with the, with the initiative, um, you know, I'm providing an update of what's happened over the past year, and I think it's important uh, to first and foremost thank Allison Beavers for the work that she put in uh, to getting a lot of this uh, underway. So, our our vision or Qatar's vision. Uh, for <clears throat> this initiative is one of an equitable exchange, uh, which really can only be achieved by understanding and accounting for diversity in all its forms while designing solutions uh, that you know, are built with inclusion in mind, right? And it's important for us that the industry remains vocal about the value add of focusing not only on these solutions, but really what has to evolve within organizations. Now, when we started the, the work in the beginning of this year, uh, we launched our, the survey in May with the, the goal of baselining current capabilities and investments across the market. Now, we don't believe this is a one-time activity, uh, and we will be continuing to seek input and updates from uh, the marketing contributors as we continue with the effort. Um, and one thing to note is we didn't just have Qatar members participating. We also had input from partner organizations, uh, industry commentators, uh, and relying parties. Uh, now, some of the early results or, or, or data that we've collected uh, from that survey has been included in the slide. And I think it helps further illustrate 
uh, a few things uh, as we di we'll dive deeper in, in future discussions. Uh, one, uh, broadly, there's a uh, understanding that investment is key in this area. It's helping uh, organizations achieve their business and mission focus. And the second uh, being that there's still room to work across uh, the industry to confirm that we're speaking really the same language when it comes to DEI uh, for identity providers and relying parties. Uh, and then the third area is that investments really range widely, right? It's some as low as 100,000 uh, upwards to over 3 million uh, over a three-year time horizon, right? And so uh, there's, there's much discussion uh, about what this looks like for the industry moving forward. As we turn to action and really the things that are going to be upcoming, um, we're going to be uh, launching a DEI committee comprised of those who have expressed interest uh, in Kantara's DEI work. Uh, so if you are interested, you just haven't raised your hand yet, please uh, reach out to Kay. Um, a first meeting of that discussion will be, or that first group convening will be on December 15th. And really the intent is that participants will be helping to frame and take action on the activities that carry us through 2023, right? Much of this has been uh, included on the, the, the slide as well for, for the general membership. Uh, and so with that, Kay, I'll turn it back over to you in case, unless there's anything like pressing uh, that folks have uh, questions on. Yes, um, unfortunately, Jordan, we've kind of, um, I'm not on mute, am I? <laughs> no, you're um, we, We've kind of had to save time for questions towards the end. So if you have questions, um, you know, and we have time at the end, we'll take those. Otherwise, you can email me and uh, Jordan or I will get back to you. So thank you for that report. Um, it's exciting to have this initiative get kicked off and we appreciate you stepping in in the leadership role, Jordan. Um, the next uh, report is about uh, our membership and, uh, and followed uh, closely by the communications report. So what, uh, what we did here is just to kind of look at what has been the membership trend year over year. Uh, this is very focused on uh, company membership, and I'll speak to individual members in a moment. Um, in 2020, we had about uh, 45 companies who were members. Uh, in 2020, we did require that to be in the assurance program, it was mandatory that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you also be a member. So some of those 45 would have been companies that were in the assurance program and perhaps not as engaged in the organization um, as a whole. In 2021, we saw a rise um, and that in 2021 continued, that membership, membership was mandatory. Um, and so again, we saw some more companies actually in the assurance program, and you can begin to see where it, it appeared that the growth happened. In 2022, there's a major shift. In 2022, membership is no longer mandatory. In fact, it's discouraged in a sense in that you don't get any discount um, in the assurance program, you don't get any special privileges if you're a member in the assurance program. And that was an attempt to really make sure that we kept the, the caliber and integrity of the program at a place where it needs to be, impartial, unbiased, no sort of input um, about the fact that, um, um, that you know, a, a member is a separate type of topic. Oh, that's your screen we're looking at. Okay. Uh, so um, anyway, so as a result in 2022, what you see is a slight bump up in, in companies who were members. But um, again, now the distinction from here going forward is that companies who are in the assurance program are not necessarily members because it's not mandatory. Now that said, Many of the companies in the assurance program have chosen to go ahead and continue their membership, but that's an additional fee. Um, so that's kind of where the organizations stand. You see that we've really grown quite a bit. Um, we have fallen off a little bit on individual members, which isn't represented here. Uh, some of that was we found that there were a lot of members on the books who actually hadn't paid and were not current in their dues. So in this past year, we've had to do a lot of cleanup. We changed uh, the association management that we had. It was previously with a company that did not track that quite as well um, as we would like. So that's changed over. Um, and so now we have about 30 paid individual members. 
Um, but we, we, um, we're certain that that's going to continue to grow as well as we get more and more folks who are really engaged and, and recognizing the benefits. So that's the, uh, the main membership report. Here's a slide a logos of all the different companies. Um, I do have to note that there are several companies actually who have asked us not to use their logo, which just kills me because we have some terrific members that aren't getting recognized here. But you can see um, it's a growing group and we're, we're really pleased with all of you out there who've really stepped up and gotten very involved. Um, I wanted to switch gears now and talk about communications. Um, this slide kind of tells it all in terms of the fact that we are, uh oh, it's Karen. Ah, Karen, do you want to go ahead and speak up? No, no, you carry on. I, I was just going to say, I think Karen Bright, um, who has uh, taken on our communication, has really, in some ways, diversified and magnified our message out there. You see, we have more interviews on the website. You see us presenting at multiple national and international conferences, some of our partnerships, um, announcements like the advisory board in the UK is right there in the middle. Uh, so a lot of really uh, good messaging happening. Karen, did you want to add a couple things? the only thing from my side is a real um, plea to all the members out there we want to amplify your stories we want to talk about the work that you're doing so please do um, reach out if you're happy to do some PR work or do some blogs together there's lots that we can achieve and hopefully you can see just in some of the the pictures there that we um, are we're, we're a great vehicle to get you out at conferences and to get you talking about the work that you as your company's doing, but also the, the work you're doing with Kantara. So please, um, it would really help me with my job um, if we could work more and more together in 2023. Very good. Um, a plea for more teamwork. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> these are some highlights. We won't go into these for now. These um, will be on the website so you can kind of see, but we've increased engagement uh, across a variety of areas. And so we're very excited about that. So now I'd like to turn to the assurance program. And for that, the first speaker um, will be Maria Vacchino, who is uh, on the board and has been the Vice President for Assurance this year. And she's going to talk about some high level changes that um, have been made and, and that we think have strengthened the assurance program. All right, thank you, Kay. Um, as all of you are aware, um, one of the main missions of the assurance program is to give relying parties and consumers confidence in the products that they're using and procuring to make sure that these products meet all of their needs. And so as part of our mission to strengthen that goal, we want to um, continue to do things to remove any even appearance of potential conflicts of interest. Um, you heard about one of those changes earlier with the way the board is structured currently, excuse me for a moment. And we're also making um, similar changes to the assurance program. So three of the things that we did this year to change the program, uh, we are separating the assurance program and membership as, as Kay mentioned earlier. We also are making sure that the uh, trust marks themselves are actually issued by the executive director rather than the, the board of directors. And appeals, if there are any, are now going to be reviewed, not by the entire board, by, but by a committee of three non-assurance program board members. So what this means is that any appeals will be reviewed by individuals on the board who are not associated with a company that is participating in the assurance program to remove any appearance of conflict of interest. And all of this is in support also of our pursuit of the ISO 17065 certification. So you're gonna be continuing to see improvements to the program over the coming year so that we can make sure that we meet all of the rigorous requirements of that certification program. And we're always looking for feedback from members. So if you have any suggestions on how we can improve the program, um, please go ahead and contact me or Kay or Lindsay or anyone else on the board and we're happy to hear about your suggestions. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Is Leif on? Okay, Lindsay, you're gonna have to cover for Leif. 
No problem. Um, so this is just an overview of the assurance program. When I started with Kintara a little over about a year and a half ago, we had eight CSPs and about five um, assessors. So that's a total of 13. And you can see now we're up to 25. And there's a little breakdown here. Currently, most of our people uh, are component services, but we've grown um, with assessors and we've also grown with registered applicants. We have a lot of people in the process. And we just wanted to make a little shout out to our brand new companies that joined or the insurance program this year. Um, so Cure, MasterCard, Shellman as an assessor, Airside Mobile, and Persona. You wanna go ahead to the next slide. Um, this is just to kind of show the membership, the growth that the assurance program has seen over the past few years. Um, there's three different colors here. The kind of darker blue gray color is um, new, new CSPs or new assessors to the program. Then there's the lighter gray that's representative of companies such as um, Experian, IDME, ones who have been with Kintara for a full grant cycle of three years and then renew that for another three year cycle. And then the green um, is showing the annual conformity reviews that the companies are required to go through each and every year. So you can just see since 2020, um, we were still in the single digits and now we are well over 20 with um, a possibility of a few more um, assessments to come in before the end of the year. Um, I'm just looking at Lorraine's comment, the difference between component and technical component. Good question. Um, that's the previous slide if you just want to go back. The difference between component and technical component is just currently, although the um, Identity Assurance Work Group will talk about some recommendations that they are talking about to revamp the program, but a technical component just means part of our assurance program. There's a, a form called the COSAC. Um, it's more organizational. And if you choose to not complete that as part of your assessment, you get a technical, meaning you were assessed against only the criteria that aligns with the, the NIST 63, um, 863-3 criteria and not the more organizational. Um, and some choose that for a variety of reasons. Does that answer your question, Lorraine? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you, and thanks for the question. Yeah, great, great job to you, Lindsay, and the Assurance Review Board. Thank you. Um, and now I'd like to turn to um, the United Kingdom, the UK certification program, uh, which we got. <laughs> Drum roll. Drum roll for Andy. Yeah. 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 Uh, and and uh, for that, um, I actually like to ask uh, Andy Hindle. Um, who is with Hindle Consulting and is on the advisory board uh, for the UK. The UK has a three-person advisory board and Andy is, participates in that and has been very helpful and I'd like him to uh, give us an overview of that program. Thank you very much, Kay, and thank you to everybody else for listening. I say that before I start speaking. I think that's always wise. Um, so yeah, uh, look, the UK, as many of you will know, has had a, a somewhat checkered history as far as verified digital identity schemes at a national scale. Um, however, there has over the last few years been a fairly significant push from the government to try and get something in place that is nationally useful, uh, not just for government to citizen use cases, but much more broadly uh, for general enterprise use cases. That work has been much informed by the various projects that have gone on uh, over the last probably decade or so. Um, and in particular, there's been a lot of industry consultation uh, right across the board, not just with identi identity industry participants, but also with enterprise to understand what the requirements would be on both sides of the equation. Um, so the end result of that is that there is now a trust framework, uh, the Digital Identity and Attributes Trust Framework. Uh, they thought long and hard about the name, and they came up with that. Um, that's been developed. It's been quote unquote agreed. It's technically in a beta stage right now with some real world testing going on. And so there may be some changes to it over time. Um, but I think the bulk of the work is, is done and is solid and reasonably well accepted, let's say. Um, there's some legislation in support of that that's gently making its way through Parliament, as you might expect. There's a certain amount of work that has to go along with that, but uh, hopefully they'll get there. 
Perhaps more importantly, there's some significant progress that's been made to help drive adoption. In particular, there are two or three large scale projects, uh, in particular, the right to work. There's a couple of others as well. They're listed on the website, the Kantara website, um, that are going to make use of the framework that are being tested. Um, and they are real use cases in the sense that there are enterprises on the other on the other side of this uh, and there are a variety of commercial attribute providers um, and that will really help test everything out and make sure that that it's working the way we expect and they are the kinds of use cases because they've got compliance requirements associated with them that ultimately should help to drive adoption over time um, of this as a as a national program so uh, with that as background and context, uh, Kantara very pleasingly uh, has been asked to step up as one of the five accredited assurance providers um, to help ensure that the various, uh, let's call them loosely identity providers, uh, need, uh, are operating according to the, the various published standards uh, that have been agreed. Um, that obviously, to Kay's point earlier, creates trust in the system um, and is understood to be really important. I think there's an understanding um, with the various authorities here in the UK that Kantara has significant history here. And particularly given the nonprofit status of the organization, that helps a lot in terms of, I guess, establishing our credibility uh, and our impartiality in, in playing this particular role. So, um, where are we now? We have, uh, to Kay's point earlier, established a UK entity that is supported by an advisory board. I play a role on that, uh, but much more importantly, two other people play a role on that. Uh, Emma Lindley, who some of you will have seen, finally received her MBE here in the UK uh, a couple of days ago, which is very exciting. Uh, and Alison McDowell has been active in this sector for a very long time, um, both extremely experienced uh, and hugely valuable to this effort. We've made some good progress since the, since the initial launch of the program. Uh, we've got four organizations currently undergoing audit. We've got a number of others that we expect to take through uh, over the course of the next few weeks and months. Um, and all of that hopefully uh, builds to a stack of progress over the next 12 months. And I hope uh, that I shall be here again in 12 months time to tell you lots more about all the exciting things that are going on. And with that, I shall turn it back to Kay. We, we hope you are too, Andy. <laughs> yes. No, I, I thank you for that, Andy. Um, it is it is a, a new program, but it is actually done very well. And I would just add that Kantara uh, was really selected, I think, because of our experience when it comes to assurance and digital identity and our stature, if you will, in the industry. And, and it's been clear as I've met with, um, there's a work group of other certification bodies. There's a lot of deference and a lot of attention paid to the expertise that we bring to the table. Uh, that's in no small part um, also because of, of our wonderful auditors. Bjorn uh, is on here from CDOT. Uh, Bjorn is not only an accredited assessor in the US, but in the UK, he has actually been our designated lead, uh, lead auditor. And he's done a tremendous job. And uh, we've been, I've been very pleased for the compliments I've gotten from a variety of government agencies about what he brings to the table. But on top of that, we also um, have accredited Kuma and Mike McGrath is on the call as well. And they are doing uh, audits in the UK also. So we're very pleased to have a really good group. And as Andy pointed out, the advisory board is incredibly strong, incredibly well known. Um, I think have um, very well respected expertise in the digital identity industry in the UK, and they've really brought a lot to the program. So we're excited to see that continue to grow and it's really just getting started. Um, so at this point, we need to, to turn now to the leadership council and the report of the work groups. And I believe that Alec Laws, who is the vice chair of the Leadership Council, will be introducing our work groups. Yeah, Alec. thanks, thanks, Kay. So just a couple of works to kick it off. I think we've been really excited by all the work that the groups have been doing this year. Uh, a lot of progress. And I think going into 2023, each group has a, a lot of sort of ambitious plans to, to continue that great work. So 
Um, won't say more than that. We'll get into the different work groups and let everybody give their update. Um, uh, I'm not sure if Andrew was oh, planning to do this one, no, but maybe uh, Martin, you can fill in. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is Martin Smith. I'm the uh, vice chair of the IAWG. And um, uh, let me say, by the way, uh, I've got a little bit of a cough, so I may have to bail out and let Lindsay take over, but I'll try to, uh, to start. So I'm going to try really hard not to read the slides to you, figuring you can read them yourself, uh, but I do have a couple of notes. Basically, the, our, our work group is a component of the assurance program along with the, uh, with the ARB and, and, and uh, the assessors. Uh, and um, it, the assurance program is, is not only an important revenue source for Kantara, uh, but it also supports, as Kay just sort of alluded to, our status as respected authority on, uh, in the identity assurance certification space. That's, that's what most people know Kantara for. Um, the specific role of the, of the work group is to maintain the criteria slash requirements that identity service providers are assessed against by our assessors uh, to, in order to receive certification. So we sort of maintain to say the specific tests that uh, they have to uh, uh, pass to get, to get certified. Um, and uh, I just uh, note the leadership there. Uh, the chair is uh, Andrew Hughes, who I think wears more hats than uh, uh, the character in uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland. Um, I'm the vice chair outgoing. Actually, we're, I think we're about to have a new one. And note that our secretary is Lindsay Adams, who is also the program manager for Assurance. So that, that keeps us tightly linked to the ARB uh, I should also mention that Marie Vicino, who you just spoke earlier, uh, is also an IAWG participant and is our link uh, to the program governance. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are what we've done in 2022 and what we're uh, planning to do in 2023. So the, the big things, the first two big things are, we actually approved a new set of the uh, the document set that, that is, is these criteria and, and other requirements, um, including a lot of attention paid to how we deal with uh, uh, component services, uh, things that are uh, services that are less than a, a complete uh, set of, uh, of uh, service offerings. Um, and uh, by the way, these are now uh, in effect, I believe, uh, Lindsay told me. Uh, so, uh, so people who have been certified should, um, you know, have a look at the latest version um, and uh, make sure that uh, there are no surprises there. There shouldn't be. Um, we also developed and submitted recommendations for rationalizing um, the, um, for rationalizing the, frame, the, the framework and how it's presented to the various stakeholders. Um, and I'll talk a bit, of, a bit more about that later. Uh, we had this, uh, developed an initial list of focus items. As most of you know, NIST is revising uh, NIST 863 um, to version four. Uh, they haven't quite got the draft out, but we had some concerns based on um, feedback we got from people who say, I'm not sure how to apply this or exactly what it means. So we'll have some comments. Uh, and we uh, transitioned the, uh, the working group leadership and I wanted to give a shout out uh, to, uh, uh, to our outgoing uh, Ken Dagg who, uh, who left the program in uh, the spring uh, after many years of service, both with the working group and elsewhere in, in uh, throughout Kantara and to, uh, to Andrew Hughes, who stepped in immediately in, uh, 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 for continuity of leadership, and also wanted to say, I'm really glad someone continues to step up uh, to take leadership roles, uh, like uh, my role, which uh, is gonna change for next year. For 2023, we are gonna uh, plan and begin implementation of our recommendations, 
uh, the ones that are approved uh, around uh, Katara, uh, in, including deprecation of the technical class of certification. I think uh, Lindsay alluded to that earlier, but we want to make sure that that's a smooth process and everybody is, uh, has time to make adjustments. And uh, we think it's a, a sound approach. Um, you'll get more information on it uh, from Lindsay uh, uh, fairly soon. Uh, we will, we expect to develop comments regarding this update of uh, their guidance. We don't know exactly when that's going to, the timing of that, but probably near the end of the year. Uh, and then once that is out, obviously we'll have to generate another update to the Katara uh, criteria. Um, and we'll, so we'll start the analysis of that probably late in the year. And then um, uh, you just heard about the UK identity framework uh, uh, pilot. We're going to track that because uh, we think we might uh, at some point be asked to uh, <clears throat> consider how it would work to set up a, an assessment uh, uh, framework uh, to support that. Next slide, please. Um, whoa, hello. Uh, that's the next. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, Martin. We're kind of crunched for time. Um, sure. so if you that's have. Fine. Some, a couple of closing remarks, then we otherwise we need to move on. Sure. Uh, so the, the next slide that we had, and I think they will be distributed after the meeting, uh, I really wasn't uh, wanting to go through it anyhow, is a list of the key recommendations. Remember I said we put out uh, a bunch of recommendations together uh, for uh, uh, clarification of the program. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Alec? Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so this is the update for the user managed access group. Uh, 2022, we had a lot of lot of activity. Um, the main thing that we created this year was a use case report around uh, how UMA can work in a healthcare environment, especially around delegation and parent child relationships and the complexities around modeling policy and sort of technical authorization system. So that report we published, it's available on our, our wiki right now. Uh, we also did a lot of work comparing how UMA fits with some of the other emerging standards in healthcare and open banking. So against UDAP and FAPI. And through that evaluation, uh, we've been looking at trying to create more backwards compatibility with OAuth 2. That's gonna be a continuing work item for us going into 2023 also. Um, and in addition to our work in the group, we also joined Kintara at a, a few different conferences, uh, one being um, EIC. Uh, we were there with Kay at the uh, Identiverse section. Uh, we had UMA one-on-one -on -one sessions at both IAWs, and we had a um, sort of a kiosk at HIMSS around UMA and healthcare, which was uh, really well received. So. Next year, we plan to, you know, continue on our, our path here, um, especially around trying to create some more backwards compatibility with OAuth to sort of achieve the next goal, which is around continuing to uh, expand our implementations, the adoption and promotion of user managed access. And uh, similar to the uh, healthcare report, uh, I think the group plans to have a open banking or financial sector use case report to show how user managed access is relevant in that that specific vertical also. So um, exciting stuff coming up also. Um, it was great to see all the engagement this year um, to date. Yeah. That's it for me. Um, thank you, Alec. Um, now to a, a new group that was formed by combining two previous work groups. Uh, Dr. Tom Sullivan, are you giving this presentation or? Yes, yes I am. Can you hear me, yeah. Kay? Yes. <clears throat> okay. I'm here, Kay, but he's, he's the lead. Okay, Jim. Jim Craig, thank you. Yeah, Jim, Jim and I are co-chairs of this new group and we've worked together on related topics for about 20 years, but this is the product of several people, some of whom are on this call, uh, like to say, uh, you know, it's it's Beth and Tom Jones and Noreen and Catherine. Uh, there's, I'm sure I'll leave out some names, but anyway, 
<clears throat> we we call this REUP, the resilient identifiers for underserved populations. Previously, we I dealt with the healthcare implications of having trusted identities, and Jim was dealing with more uh, generic uh, industries. So we combined this group uh, over this just recently. We've developed a charter over the last year. We finalized it. And our focus is basically facilitating online identities for uh, underserved populations, homeless, people who are impoverished, uh, low income, uh, not well educated, that sort of thing, a very difficult group. But we think our, our sort of secret sauce is that through many surveys, there's a huge percentage of these underserved populations that have smartphones or at least phones. And so we wanna be able to leverage that in helping establish trusted identities. <clears throat> that's that's basically the, the third bullet because these people still have to engage in some form of e-commerce, which is becoming more and more, um, more and more widespread and, and helping people get the benefits that, that they need. So you see there the co-chairs, the names of our, our, our uh, folks who are in leadership um, and we'll collaborate with the other Cantera work groups and other outside entities. We've been, some of us have been very active with the Karen Alliance, uh, the company I work for, um, brought in ID.me a couple of years ago. A lot of these relationships go back to the old IDESG where we formed our, our knowledge and, uh, you know, started following uh, NIST. Uh, through the different iterations of 863. So we're recruiting new members and looking for uh, research grants to facilitate uh, our goals. And that's a very generic presentation. We could get into a lot more specifics. Uh, and I, you know, as somebody who's been taking care of patients for almost 50 years, um, I know healthcare and, and the underserved population pretty well. But uh, thank you, I'm all set. Thanks, Dr. Tom. Thank you. Um, the next group, the privacy enhancing mobile credentials, is uh, Heather. Are you the one giving this report, or? Well, I didn't think I was, but I don't see John on the call. I don't either. So, hmm. so I'm picking on you. <laughs> All right, let's let's play some slide deck karaoke. Uh, right. So I'm. Uh, acting as the Secretary for the Privacy Enhancing Mobile Credentials Working Group in Kantara. Um, and that's where we're, we're looking at the, the ecosystem of mobile credentials. Uh, a lot of focus on mobile driver's license, but I think it, it does go a little bit beyond that. And what, what are the, the best practices to um, encourage a, a privacy enhancing environment for the issuers, for the verifiers, for the holders and, and the people who are providing them wallets. Uh, we have an early implementers report, which we are in the process of drafting. It has this diagram and a lot of text. Uh, we meet generally twice a week to cover that. I have been writing some blog posts to try and uh, introduce people to what's coming and what we're thinking about. Uh, so I encourage you to look at those. Um, I am the technical editor, editor for that as well. So that's that's part of where I get my grubby little paws um, on the document. Um, would this be considered as a decentralized identity? I, I don't think so, but I also don't think it precludes that. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question to take back to the group to see how they, they, they consider it, but I think that's a little bit orthogonal in a way. Okay, that was my my super speedy update. Thank Very you. Good. And and I would mention to the members um, the blog post that Heather is doing. You'll see uh, out in our communications and linked from the Kantara website, so you can find the excellent work that Heather is doing and that the committee or that the work group is busy working on. So, um, and I know that Karen, our communications lead, has tried to also sort of promote that. So I encourage you to watch for that. Thank you, Heather, for, for stepping in there. Um, <laughs> no problem. Now we turn to the uh, advanced notice and consent work group, the anchor group. Is that 
Sal D'Agostino? Yep. It should be. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Yep. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, you know, it was interesting. I've been reading recently something published in 2019 called uh, Gilgamesh, The Life of a Poem. And in it, the author, Michael Schmidt, um, says the original language of Sumer and Akkad were devised to record quantities and values and itemize commercial transactions. So what that means is that receipts and records enabled commerce and allowed decentralized governance 5,000 years ago. So as a work group, we're as a work group, we're just trying to do that today. Um, and and in doing so, we're carrying on what is effectively about a 10 year effort uh, on this over that on this topic. Um, some of it, which has already been uh, has resulted in previous standards uh, like ISO 29184, which is online privacy notices and consent. So. Uh, the work of this work group is already contributing to international standards around um, notice and consent, and we're trying to uh, expand on that, and in particular to try to uh, make, make it human centric for uh, as opposed to mm -hmm. uh, the way consent may be implemented currently today, as I, I think a lot of people are probably aware. Um, so a lot of history recently this year, I mean, there were two things. The, the actual standard, which a lot of people in Kintara have been involved with on the consent record information structure, um, multiple people in our work group are actually members of national committees. And as a work group, we continue committed, uh, contributed uh, comments. There's a link to them. Uh, I thought I had that, but it's certainly, uh, it's on a blog post on our website. And then more recently this year, there is actually uh, an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking uh, coming out of the FTC. And uh, again, ironically, um, the, you, the FTC is putting out an advance notice in order for them to make rules, right? So all that, again, we're asking for online is for there be a way for people to get an advance notice before rules are made about how our data takes place. Um, besides that, we actually put, tried to put focus them on the current work that we're doing in the work group and how we think effectively two-factor notice, which is notice of risk and proof of notice, um, might actually address a lot of the uh, concerns across the 95 questions that they had in that. Um, and I think this sort of goes to what Kantara, you know, kind of a, a bit of the innovation heartbeat that's always been part of Kantara, is trying to address you know, some of the issues that are out there in the world and bring new technology to the fore. And, and, and and I think there's a lot of aspects of assurance from a human perspective that our work can contribute to Kantar and hopefully, you know, have that grow into globally the kinds of assurance programs that as an organization we provide. Um, we have been working for a long time to get a Kantar specification out, which is an update to the consent receipt. Um, we're narrowing that down and we'll expect to do that in early 2023 on something which is called an open notice record. Um, interestingly, consent is something that takes place a little further down line in, in the workflow. Um, and some of the problems with consent in the marketplace today is people have jumped to consent before actually establishing a basis of for which it could be given. So the open notice record looks to try to address some of that. And in order to be able to do that, there's certain transparency that's involved in terms of the human interaction. Um, those are where these transparency performance indicators come into place. And those are things that could contribute very directly to uh, an assurance program. And then besides that, there's this notice credential, which you can make with the receipt from the record, uh, which actually um, allows a person to put a, 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 a credential in a notice and do all sorts of fun things, but uh, you know that's please come and join the way. So as why you would want to join the work group, please come and learn how to do that sort of uh, next generation digital identity engineering fun stuff. Um, a lot of what we one of the things that's exciting is that a lot of work over a, a reasonable period of time is actually coming to fruition in other places and other groups. Um, and so the, the work that we're doing at Cantara is contributing to other standards in other places. Um, and these are just some examples of where 
other organizations in the digital ecosystem are building on uh, some of the work that we're doing. Um, and, and it's pretty exciting, frankly, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Sal. Thanks for your leadership on this. And, and just uh, you know, to, to echo Sal's call to action for on, on behalf of all the work groups, um, you know, that is one of the values of being a member is, is participation and engagement in the work groups. The member dues pay for the support of, of work groups in addition to other things, but um, you know, please get engaged. Uh, that's why we added this as part of the uh, annual meeting is to share uh, updates on the work that's being done um, so that members can uh, see what's of interest to them uh, and their organizations and get involved where appropriate. So please reach out. Um, if you need help getting engaged, uh, you can reach out directly to Kay um, or the work group leaders um, or Andrew um, Hughes or Alec. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. I, I just wanted to kind of give a shout out and thank all of the work group leadership. I know you all have day jobs and I really appreciate the amount of time and effort that you devote to your work groups. If you go back to the membership report that I gave you, the two areas that we've seen the largest increase in companies are the very large companies and the sort of medium sized. And from talking with some of the very large companies, it's participation in the work groups that has really driven their membership and why they want to be a part of Kantara, not just for the assurance program, but to be actively engaged with these groups. And I think all of your reports show exactly why that is. Um, because you are really working on some important things and some very cutting edge uh, areas. And we're, we're very excited to support your work and we are grateful for your time. Um, okay, looking to uh, the next report on liaisons, on liaisons and associations. This is just, uh, will be my report. Um, and I don't have all of the uh, logos up here of the various organizations that we participate with, some because I didn't get permission, so I didn't want to throw their logo on there and have them yell at me later since it will be up on our website. But um, Tom uh, Sullivan mentioned the Karen Alliance. Uh, not only do does Kintara work very closely with them, but we are part of their proof of concept pilot program. Um, as some of you may know, ONC um, has published their TEFCA, which is their trust framework for the healthcare industry, if you will. And in that, it mandates that uh, identity solution providers to the healthcare providers need to be IAL2 or AAL2 certified. Um, and we're very pleased to partner with them. I don't know that anyone specifically from the Karen Alliance is on today, but we do partner with other folks in that proof of concept. So I kind of like to recognize some of our federal partners. Adam McBride, who is with HHS, is on the call. And I'd like to give a shout out. Uh, he's been a terrific partner. We've spoken on many, many panels together on a lot of these uh, conferences that we've referenced earlier today. Uh, but he's really been terrific and has been great to work with. Um, also uh, from GSA on the call today, I'm not sure I'm going to say the name correctly, but uh, Beber Koei, I probably totally ruined your name, I apologize, from GSA as well as Phil Lamb. They've also been terrific partners. Um, and also I'd like to acknowledge our NIST representatives, David Temeshock and Ryan Galuzzo are all both on the call or they were at the beginning of the call. Um, and they've also been really terrific to work with. So uh, their logos aren't all on here, but they're very much a part of the work. Some of the other organizations I'm sure you would recognize. I'd also like to, to thank those of you who serve as liaisons in various capacities to ISO. Uh, we have a couple of different liaisons in those work groups, and that is really important and valuable. Um, you'll see DIAC in Canada, we work closely with. Digital Identity New Zealand is another organization that we, uh, that we also align with. Um, we've been doing more and more work with the Women in Identity. And now in the UK, our partnership with T-Scheme, which is based in the UK, has been even more um, of, of an important partnership that we have across the pond. Um, as Richard would say. So uh, it's just an acknowledgement. We, we are actively engaged and we really appreciate that everyone um, 
has really stepped up their involvement with us. And uh, I'm grateful. I've heard from several people that they've heard more about Kantara in circles than they ever had in the past. So I, I think that is a good sign. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Matt to uh, kind of talk about our election. Yeah, and if if uh, if you want to jump to the just straight to the next slide, so um, you know I, I've been on the board and serving as president for for three years. Uh, you know I am transitioning off the board. Um, you know just to allow for some new leadership to uh, to step up. Uh, I, I have enjoyed. Um, every minute of it, uh, working with Colin and now Kay and, and helping kind of lead the search for Colin's replacement um, and, and working through that transition, uh, as well as uh, working with the board to set our strategic priorities over, over the last uh, two to three years has, has been absolutely joy. And it's been great to see um, us continue to uh, um, accomplish and deliver more on our, our mission, our vision, and uh, to continue to grow uh, financially stable as an organization. Um, I'm I'm especially proud of you know this slate of uh, candidates. Again, I, I referenced you know we wanted to eliminate kind of this uh, pay to play uh, uh, board structure we had prior because uh, one uh, I I felt like it was um, a block or an obstacle for getting uh, people on that wanted to uh, bring you know their talent, skills, and abilities to the board um, and, and, you know, limited the size uh, of the board that we had at the time. So, you know, we, we opened that up. Uh, you're seeing a great group of industry leaders here of um, identity, data privacy, uh, SMEs, well uh, respected uh, and, and, and known throughout um, our industry, um, a diverse group of, of business leaders, technologists, um, but bringing a lot to the table. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see so many of our existing board members to continue on uh, with the board. And again, um, you know, as I look across uh, their, their pictures here, um, I can think of tons of effort and many hours that each one of them have put into advancing um, our organization, acting as fiduciaries on behalf of the membership and and putting in a lot of work to um, to take Cantera to another level and um, so I appreciate all that they have done and will continue to do. Uh, excited to see um, you know just some uh, like rock star superpowers in this space: Andy Hindle, uh, Mike Engel, uh, Mike McGrath, uh, all who I uh, personally know and and uh, respect um, and know that each one of them are going to bring a lot of great things to uh, uh, to the board next year. Um, each one of them has a, um, a short bio, which I'm not gonna read <laughs> right now. Um, I do have them all printed out, have read through all of them. I encourage everyone to uh, take some time to look at their backgrounds if you're not already familiar with them. Um, but I certainly highly uh, endorse and, and promote and will be voting for each of them as they bring a lot of uh, wonderful um, talents to the board that are only going to be for the benefit of Cantera. So please take time to uh, read about and um, vote. Voting will start tomorrow. Uh, we'll send out member communications. Um, but, uh, you know, excited about the group of people that we have here um, on this slide and what they're going to do for the uh, organization going forward. So thank you. Thank you all. Um, any questions? I don't have a question, Matt, but just a comment about everything Cantera is working on. I had no idea. Uh, a lot of those working groups that you talk about, I hear my clients, you know, concerned about the, you know, underserved, for example, I, it's just something that comes up in a lot of my circles. So it's really cool to see the breadth of the things that everybody's working on. I participate in a lot of the stuff in the um, vital Alliance and uh, you know, there's similar working groups uh, that that we all participate in, but these are these are really cool. So uh, thanks for sharing all of that, and I appreciate the the effort that goes into those quite a bit. Thank you, Mike. Andrew, you had uh, Johnston. Uh, yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, I I just wanted to 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 voice my thanks, and I think I speak for other members of the board and the membership of Kantara Initiative. 
uh, to, to thank you for your leadership these many years and guiding the board and getting us into the, the position and, and finding Kay to help us have the excellent year that we had this year. Uh, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrew. Much appreciated. Like, like many involved in cancer, it's a labor of love. Um, <laughs> thank you. And best wishes to the, uh, the new board. And, and again, please uh, please uh, vote when you receive the, uh, the link so that we can uh, um, formalize all that as soon as possible. I just wanted to add um, the if you you see this is this slide is taken from the website right and if you click on everyone's name you can actually read their bio there. There's also a link to their LinkedIn profile. So there's uh, ways that you can uh, go ahead and and read more about all the candidates if you're interested in doing that. Um, you know if there are people that you don't always know. Um, I did want to want to just sort of explain a little bit about the mechanics. You will be getting a link and it goes to members. Only one person can vote. Oh, thank you. It looks like Lindsay has put a link in the chat for us. Thank you, um, Lindsay. Uh, only one vote per organizational member. So if you're in an organization and there are multiple people from your company who participate in Kantara, that's wonderful, but only one of you can vote for the organization. Um, all individual members, uh, should vote. It's, the voting is open to both individual and organization, although um, per the bylaws, only organizational members can stand for election to the board, um, but everyone has a vote. The other thing to know is that all of these folks are on the ballot, so there's 10 people to vote for. So you don't just vote for the slate, you vote for individuals, and your choices are yes, no, and abstain. Um, so we really encourage you to go ahead and vote. I, I often get questions about, but I don't know so-and-so. Um, well, if you choose, you could choose to abstain from that one, but each, each candidate gets a vote from you. So <clears throat> just know it'll take you a couple minutes, but you need to go through all of them and register a vote. Um, it will be open for 10 days. Uh, we did have to extend it last year because we needed a few more people to, to vote. So hopefully this year, you'll all log in right away tomorrow and get that taken care of before the holidays. Um, so we appreciate all of that. And I didn't wanna cut off if someone else had comments, but um, just to make sure you understand the mechanics of how it works, we really appreciate you participating in, in selecting your leadership. The board can't appoint officers and such until the the the, we get enough votes to close the voting um, and formalize the board. So again, that's the, I, I think we've made that clear. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, uh, and actually we are way ahead of schedule. So uh, I don't know if we wanna- open Any questions, it. comments? You can uh, advance the next. Okay. Wow. Thank you all. Thank you for participating. And we hope to see you at lots more uh, virtual meetings and in-person meetings and bring your friends. Um, we, we need more and more folks to be a part of Kintara. We're doing really great things. And I hope you'll share with everyone the amazing things happening here and why it's a great place to be and be a part of. Thank, Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Happy holidays. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Kay. Talk to you soon.